Okay, folks, let's go ahead and get this show on the road here. Okay, so here's what we are going to be talking about today, um, which is the death, the impending death of the corporate art period. So uh, this is going to be a little bit of cultural analysis to kind of switch things up here um, today. And uh, we'll, you know, I'll also have writing tips and talk about um, what this means for the market, for books and all that kind of stuff um, as we go. So there should be a little bit of something for everyone today, a um, little bit of entertainment and a little bit of education, particularly when it comes to marketing. So uh, let's see here. Um, <clears throat> here's going to be my thesis before I you know, try to get into the chat. Just as a reminder, um, actually I'll do I'll do my normal format but before I get into things. Chat that occurs before the stream starts may disappear. In fact, it usually does disappear. So if you're writing stuff like hours early, it may disappear by the time I get to it. That's just a warning. Um, channel news, there's not that much to report um, other than the normal stuff. So. Uh, we'll be continuing the right stream for a little while. Maybe I'll finish off the year. Might be good to get, uh, you know, 50 or 52 different live streams related to this. I think this is number 44 total. Um, so that's quite a number of these that I've done at this point. Um, so that's what um, that's what I'd like to do is cut, maybe try to get it to 50 and then we will transition to maybe a different kind of stream that is more fun or just focused on different things um, than just the craft of writing. At a certain point, you know, I start getting questions like, can you cover this or that? And I've covered all those things, right? I'm like running out of things to talk about. So this one is uh, kind of crossing over into the other territory that I do, which is a lot of cultural analysis kind of stuff. So here's the thesis. Um, which is we are beginning to exit an art period that I am calling the corporate period. Um, if you are familiar with art history or music history or uh, even history of drama and things like that, we tend to divide uh, we tend to divide history up into these different periods that are defined by their style and defined by you know how music is performed, how art is actually created, how it's drawn, as well as the culture's relationship with that art form or art in general. Uh, just as an example, if we're looking at you know common practice music, the earliest period that we really look at is the medieval period. And the medieval period runs all the way up um, maybe into the 15th century. Uh, depending on how you want to look at it. And if you look at the medieval period, you find that almost the entirety of the medieval period is focused around religious music. That is uh, music that was performed as part of religious ceremonies, part of the mass uh, in particular. So chant, um, organum, chant evolving into organum, evolving into late, late medieval proto-polyphony and things like that before you start to get to the Renaissance period, which is likewise dominated by religious um, religious music, but is starting to see more record of folk music. And I want to start with the medieval period because it's important to note that we study religious music of the medieval period and we study the liturgy of the medieval period, not because that was the only music being produced, but, but, but because that is what we have records of. So there has always been a folk music that is the music that people commonly consumed played performed amongst each other you can think like drinking songs would be part of the folk music tradition and then there's been other traditions that run parallel to those mix with them or separate themselves from the folk tradition and when we get up to the corporate period you're going to find an interesting mix of these two things i think so i want to lay that foundation there was of course secular music in the medieval period and of course most music was actually secular but it wasn't recorded, and one of the only ways that we have secular music recorded is with lute tablature. And this is partly because lute tablature was designed for players to transmit and take notes about what they were playing on the lute, but also because a notation, formal music notation as we know it, hadn't yet been invented or was in the process of developing. If you guys get yourself like a Libra Usualis, which is actually now repressed since Vatican II, um, just, just 
a book of chants and things like that, you'll notice that it's written in what's called pneumatic notation, which used to still be taught to um, to priests, as, you know, before Vatican II, basically. Uh, it's written in four lines rather than five line staff and looks very, very different, but it, it's what predates and, and comes before our modern notation system. So once we have that notated because the church needed to transmit those chants, that's when we start having records of art. It's different with drawn art, art that is visual, statues, things like that. We have ancient statues. We, uh, we've we uncovered you know frescoes from the Roman period. So with visual art, we actually have a much bigger and broader idea of what's going on than with music. But it's the same thing with art. You find that there's a difference between art which was created for specific purposes and specific styles such as religious ceremonies and then art that was created by the folk or for the folk and depending on what which period you're looking at there's a little bit closer association there so uh, we have the medieval that kind of binds things up in this style and also this relationship with music um, and with art uh, where art tends to be focused on you know there's a lot of artists that work for the church a lot of art that's made as part of you know say illuminated manuscripts things like that and then by the time you get to the Renaissance period, then you have a different focus on art. Um, you have Renaissance drama. You have this big explosion of drama with things like Shakespeare and uh, many others, but Shakespeare is the one that, that tends to be the most famous. Um, you have an explosion of visual art where you have a, an increasing of detail, a rediscovery of ancient, um, ancient traditions from the Roman period uh, in visual arts. And then in music, you have the development of polyphony and harmony. Now, harmony... For those who study church history, harmony was originally uh, not performed in the early Christian church because it's inherently emotionally manipulative, which is an interesting thing to think about. So by the Renaissance period, we start getting harmony. Polyphony is what dominates the, the history of music. Um, Renaissance art has its own styles. We start to have perspective and we start to have broader um, compositions, compositions that include multiple highly detailed accurate figures so the um the art starts to be the object itself rather than be a representation of the object um so it we start getting iconography in the in the renaissance period that's incredibly realistic um whereas if you were to look at say a side track the, the iconography of the of the late eastern roman empire um leading into the renaissance period tends to be much more um abstract in a way a little bit unrealistic. Here, we have a super chat, $2. You are awesome. Thank you, Hive Tyrant. I appreciate that. Um, once we get past the Renaissance period, we start to go into what is typically called the Baroque period, named after a Baroque pearl. Of course, these periods are usually named after the people afterward, right? So the Renaissance was a rediscovery. Uh, Baroque was about doing things that were grotesque. Uh, that is things that are highly detailed, highly figured, and complex. That was what the relationship of art was. That was the artistic goal in a broad sense for most of the art, which was produced either secularly through patronage, produced um, secularly through market relationships such as opera, or produced for the church. All of them had this goal of producing highly complex and um, very, very deep levels of art. So in the Baroque period, late and high Baroque, you get, you know, J.S. Bach. Um, of course, you get all of the Italian masters, you know, Monteverde and Vivaldi and all those uh, French composers. And Baroque art, you start to see a parallel there as well, where in the visual art, the composition gets increasingly more complex. And rather than say, you know, in the Renaissance, we, we have this view of, of some of these really outstanding Renaissance pieces, like say Michelangelo's David, which is a single statue of one figure. And you have, say, the Mona Lisa, which is a single portrait of one figure. But you also have more complexity in the Renaissance too. You know, the Last Supper or, say, the Sistine Chapel, which is incredibly detailed and huge. Whereas the goal of the Baroque starts to be to really have a lot of stuff going on. So most of the fountains that you see in Rome are not from the Roman period. Obviously, most of those did not survive, but were in fact built during the Baroque and um, the period following the Baroque, depending on what art you're in, would be kind of the Enlightenment or um, or the classical period if you're looking more at music. So um, the Baroque period would have the, you know, the statues with multiple figures, just piles of figures in marble. The paintings would have a really large scene fe featuring like a central historic figure you know, maybe the king, and then there's 
a huge amount of detail in the background. So rather this kind of subdued background that we get in the Renaissance where everything's focused on the figure, in the Baroque it's like the background becomes just as important. You also have genre painting emerge in the Baroque. Um, genre painting, of course, very popular in um, places like the Netherlands and Belgium, where you know you just are painting peasants or painting people playing lutes is a whole genre in the Baroque period. Kind of interesting to think about. So these things are kind of bound together. So we get medieval, Renaissance, Baroque. After that, we start to get lots of other things. We get the classical period in music, get the enlightenment. You start to have the romantic period, which across all art tends to focus on the emotional. Then you have the post-romantic, which is taking that to the next level, taking everything to the theoretical next level. You have these big operas that Wagner would do, like the Ring Cycle that was just three nights of three or four hour operas, like 12 hours of opera, and like going to see the Lord of the Rings kind of stuff. Modern period is where it starts to get interesting, and this is where I want to lay the you know the final floor before I talk about the corporate period. So if I'm going into too much detail here, I apologize, but I promise I have a point with all this. So by the time we get to the 20th century, we have a very, very interesting set of things emerge. So we've had genre, we have genres before this. We have genres in fiction exist before the 20th century, but we start to get what's called a genrefication of art to a greater degree. So there's genre painting. There's also, you know, historical fiction as a genre. Um, you know, if you're reading Sir Walter Scott or someone like that, uh, there's historical fiction um, as a genre. And there's other literary genres that are kind of exclusively 19th century. There's even Gothic literature, which really begins in the 19th century. Um, in the 20th century, you, you have this divergence in approaches to art between art which is created by and for the folk and art which is existing in this other more academic mode uh, we have start to have a rise of states states increase in size i'm talking about um, governments so the government be increases in size and power so one of the first things that happens when the government really explodes in size at the beginning of the earliest 20th century is there's a world war and then um, most of the countries respond after World War with fiat currency during the uh, World War I. And uh, all the socialism which followed World War I then explodes into World War II. So World War I and World War II, if you zoom far enough back, seem to be a direct result of states, states getting big. This is also when you have an explosion in the university system. So uh, we start to have a, a big change in the dynamics of society in the 20th century. And of course, that changes the way that art is produced and the way people relate to art. So down one avenue, we start to have art, which is modern, the modern period. So if you're ever studying art history, you'll go in and you'll study this art from the modern period, which is going to be early 20th century. You have things like cubism as a, as a visual art, and you have things like 12-tone music in music. And the main relationship with art and aesthetics in the modern period is a belief in the ability of man to create things which are new. So modern buildings are those big, blocky skyscrapers. Um, Postmodern buildings tend to be just like geometric shapes and other nonsense you know that it could look anything could be aesthetically pleasing so the postmodern anything could be art anything can be aesthetically pleasing aesthetics are completely subjective modern is we can create new aesthetics with new meanings that do what we want them to do so of course there's a tight relationship with the state itself the entire relationship of people who are running the state and the state is no longer a state serving a purpose or a state representing people or a state representing culture. It becomes a state that we make the state what we want it to be to do what we want to, to do in society, to make society what we want it. So rather than the state having a relationship with people, it's like the state is supposed to be affecting people. This is very, very much um, in the... <coughs> in the Marxist and Leninist traditions, but it is, of course, present in America as well. Uh, it's when we get the Federal Reserve. It's like, what was the Federal Reserve? 19, 1911 or 1908? I'm trying to remember. Um, so yeah, we get the Federal Reserve, which is where we take over the banking sector. Now the state takes over the banking sector. You start to get old age pensions in the Weimar Republic. You start to get 
things like Social Security in the United States. So the state begins to affect society in a way that the state is a, is a ring of power that we can use to affect society. Um, and that's the, that's, the, that's the modern. So in an artistic sense, the modern is about taking a new design that you've created and using it to make art, which affects people in new ways. So we get things like 12-tone music. And if you've never heard the music of Arnold Schoenberg, I've talked about this in past streams. It's very harsh and dissonant. Most people don't like it. So if you're studying art history and you're looking at something like Cubism and you're looking to postmodern stuff like, you know, Jackson Pollock, uh, you might come to the conclusion if you had never stepped outside before, never seen anything outside that class, you might come to the conclusion that there was no good art in the 20th century, that the 20th century was about people really hating their art. And... Um, the 20th century was about people really hating their music and it's like what a horrible time to be alive like 1920 to 25 would be an absolutely terrible time to be alive because art was so bad but because of genreification we have a whole different thing going on which is art which is created for patronage art which was created for the folk and art which is created by the folk goes down its own path and in music that path just continues the post it continues the post romantic and impressionist traditions but in ways that people don't think so jazz music actually takes onto itself all of the theoretical devices of wagner holst richard strauss all of those the post romantic music theory gets transferred into jazz by the time we get to bebop and even before then so we have a folk music which is primarily associated with black Americans at the at the outset, but has become multiracial as time has gone on. Um, the These black musicians actually begin playing with this highly complex theory that is derived from post-romantic um, music theory. Now, post-romantic music theory is merely a continuation of what's called common practice music theory. Common practice music theory is the tonal system which was discovered, not developed, um, throughout the course of, of history in every culture. So just so you you guys know, if you go and you look at every culture, you'll notice every culture uses a tonal system which is based on mathematical relationships between pitches. If you compare this to Arnold Schoenberg's music, Arnold Schoenberg's music takes the 12 notes of the piano. You can't see my piano next to me, but takes the 12 notes of the piano and says, well, we're going to give them all equal weight. They're going to be all equal. Well, it is, I wonder what that has parallels to, guys. It's, it's more of that modern socialist ideal. So... Um, and it, of course, the result is hideous, just like socialism. But he takes those 12 and says, we're going to create these rows so that all 12 tones are heard roughly the same amount in a composition. They're all equal. The thing is, is that the 12 notes of the keyboard does not represent reality. I have gone over to in, uh, over in detail this in various music theory lectures. But the reality is the 12 notes in equal temperament tuning is an approximation of pitches. We adjust all the tuning so that we can play roughly in every key only a little bit out of tune, but they don't represent the math there. Um, and if you were to, to actually start with a pitch and you were to go up the harmonic sequence, you'd find all the notes for both the major and minor scale are, are within that. So the theory of the post-romantic is merely using the tonal system to its maximum ability. It's using every tool available to affect the, the listener and make them feel passion. Whereas Schoenberg, you either feel annoyed or nothing most of the time. Now, I actually have an appreciation for Schoenberg's music, but that's the modern aesthetic. And so the modern aesthetic, because it's hated by people, basically is a completely artificial co construct. And if we were to go into the future 200 years, and we were to look at art history classes taught in 200 years, what you might find unless there's been an active attempt to suppress the reality of music in the 20th century, what you might find is that there'll be a couple of lectures on this weird thing called modern academic music in the first half of the 20th century, some of the composers that were there and how this was taught in universities throughout the 20th century, but that no one really listened to it. It was very unpopular, and uh, orchestras may have played it. State-funded orchestras often played this for people, but people generally didn't like it, and most state-funded orchestras always had to play Beethoven, Brahms, or Bach if they wanted people to show up, and that's that's reality. The L.A. Philharmonic, um, which I've actually played with the L.A. Philharmonic. I'll tell that story sometime. Uh, but anyway, the L.A. Philharmonic's got to gotta program some music that people like because even in this dense metropolitan place that's full of academics, 
people still won't show up to an orchestra concert unless there's something from the 19th century or before on the program or something newer that's that's say minimalist minimalism is a is a style that shows up at the end of the 20th century which is returning to the tonal system not um rebelling against it in any way so what we get is this popular popular style so jazz is a great example now if we're looking at something like, and I'm looking at some of the comments, if you're looking at something like high art or low art or something like that, these are these are constructed ideas. Uh, I call it music of the folk and other things, right? So there's a classification, which is the music which is made by and for the general population of people. Your average person without musical training enjoys this music. Then there's other there's other things that go with it. So obviously the music, music that's composed by, um, you know, Jacobus Obrecht for the Catholic Church in the 15th century, or actually he was lived in the 16th century. Now people heard that at the church, but that wasn't something that people wanted to hear or were even able to hear on a regular basis. Remember before the invention of recorded music, people never heard music unless they could perform it themselves. So folk music prior to the 20th century tends to be way simpler than it is today. And I point this out to people that are like, music today is so dumbed down. It's like the music of 400 years ago that people heard on a regular basis was monophonic drinking songs, bro. It's not more complex than what we have today. If you're comparing Beethoven to whatever rap, mumble rap garbage you hear today, you're comparing music that no one heard when Beethoven was alive. Like barely anyone heard Beethoven and he was immensely popular. Most people never heard his music or if they did hear Beethoven, someone might have played Beethoven for them once or twice in their life. You're comparing that to something that is played at Applebee's or whatever, right? It's not a valid comparison. So going down this this line. So that, that represents the modern direction. And this is primarily something that becomes insular and focused in really a small subculture of academics and only becomes prolific as academics teach it to their students. So if you go and you study art at the university level, you may have to study modern art and you'll be encouraged to produce modern art, not to produce art that uses classical styles. And chances are your education in classical technique, even up to and including holding a brush, might be absent from a modern art education at the university level. Um, and so we get that. We get that that happens in both art and definitely happens in music. So if you're studying, say, music or art history, you also get to this period called the postmodern. And the postmodern is different from the modern in that it's even less popular. So the modern still had Stravinsky, you know, and it still had Bartok and some of these composers that, that still used the tonal system and mixed it up and just did really original things. But by the time you get to the postmodern, you get guys like Milton Babbitt and John Cage and a whole slew of other composers that will probably be a footnote in 200 years because their music is unlistenable. Aleatoric music is one of the things in that you get in the postmodern period where, you know, I had a composition teacher um, and what he did was he would take rice and dip it in ink and throw it at staff paper on the wall. And wherever the rice hit and made a mark, those were the notes. Now, do you think that that's going to come out being beautiful and enjoyable to people? It's going to produce sound. Uh, but the whole point of the postmodern is that anything could be art or anything could be enjoyable or aesthetics ultimately are subjective. And when you say everything is subjective, you're really saying aesthetics don't have any kind of deeper meaning that they can point to uh, because the meaning would be universal. So aesthetics, if they're not universal, then they don't have any, any kind of deeper meaning uh, at all. So <laughs> Jesse says they might be absent. They're totally absent. Yeah. So uh, they talk about art technique in a modern art school. It's the same thing with music and music composition. You might totally lack some of the classical techniques. Although I will say that the usually music education tends to focus a lot more on, on classical techniques and how to actually play your instrument. They just don't necessarily hold people to those standards, particularly in composition schools. Um, so anyway, that's the trajectory. And so if you go study art history now, anything past the 20th century, you're actually not studying what is relevant. You're studying the most irrelevant garbage that nobody cares about. And in 200 years, nobody is going to, there's going to be two lectures in, in a year long seminar course on this weird academic music that people made this, this bizarre noise music that was popular in the sixties and seventies and the orchestra music that was played at universities, which was unlistenable, you know, it's like, why did people do this? And you might have a lecture about, yeah, well, 
People were forced to go to universities in order to get education, to get a job. They were funneled through their institutions to do this stuff. So let's talk about the real stuff. So from the 20th century onward, we have um, we have the development of mass media, and this is where folk music starts to get very interesting. Um, the first big development in the United States was jazz. Coming out of ragtime, which is a folk style music played live, we start to have jazz and the explosion of jazz in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and even into the 50s. And so that explosion of jazz what it's fueled fueled by big time besides there's actually state support of big bands <laughs> um which happened in the 40s um but we don't, we don't need to talk too much about that it's mostly about the the medium called a vinyl i don't have any vinyls in this room unfortunately they're all in my record player in the other room but this thing called a record a, phono, a phonograph is originally a cylinder that you could record on but the gramophone this record so you could buy this from the store and you could put it on your record player and you could listen to the band playing at your home in your convenience when you wanted to. This had tremendous effects on music and it we have a parallel in film. So film and music are the ones I'm really going to focus on because they're the ones that amplify this effect and other kinds of art, we only start to get this effect kind of sideways in that and then towards the end. And the other form I'll talk about is comics. Um, because comics represent a new medium that was created out of the mass media explosion. So with music, you have this re- this record. You could put, on, put your gramophone on there and you can listen to it at home. This is the first big mass media thing. You could go down to a store and buy a record of whatever, of Louis Armstrong or whoever you wanted to listen to, put it on your record player and listen to Louis Armstrong. And not just listen to Louis Armstrong's song played by a band, which is what you had to do in the 19th century. If you heard John Philip Sousa, it was because the local brass band was playing John Philip Sousa. But in the 20th century, you could hear John Philip Sousa played by the Marine Band this exact same way every single time you listened to it. Not only that, but your cousin who had the same record was hearing it the exact same way. So everybody was not just listening to Louis Armstrong's music. They were listening to him having never seen his physical presence in front of them. And that is the beginning of mass media. And it starts with music because music was the first one that we could put it all in and we could all have the exact same experience. Now there's parallels before that called books. So books are really the first one. Once we have the printing press, everybody can have the exact same book with the exact same words. But it's different when it's a performance element, like drama, like music, because music is not just written and visualized. It is actually heard and felt. So uh, that's a huge one. And from then on, we have a trajectory of popular music that is extremely interesting and own and complex. So if anyone who says that like jazz is most most modern academics would not say jazz is low art but certainly people at the time would say that because it wasn't classical the word classical was just invented to say well we're orchestra musicians and we play like a more high high kind of kind of music but bebop and hard bop was theoretically more complex uh in a lot of ways than the music that um people were playing in orchestras you know Uh, So it had its own trajectory of complexity. Now, where does the corporate period begin? I would say the corporate period actually begins in the 1950s. Because in the 1950s, we finally get the equivalent of the radio and the record player. Because the radio can, of course, transmit the exact same recording. Like they put on the record and you hear it. So the radio, uh, an audio version, we have the television. And so when we have the television, now we have a true chance for mass media to explode. Not only are people watching the same play, like they're watching a teleplay, right? They're watching a TV show. It's a play, but they're not only are they watching the same play, they're watching the same actors at the same time in the same angle everywhere, everywhere. That's incredible to think about. So the 1950s is the beginning of the corporate period. Now, why do I call it the corporate period? Let me explain this. So the corporate period is called that because art All of the high art, all of the art which is popular and which people actually consume um, is produced by corporations. And this includes the high art, the cinema, you know, the Godfather, right? These are made by corporations. Why are they made by corporations? It's because the technological expense of creating the music can only really be funded collectively. 
And so in Western countries, we have done that through the corporate infrastructure, which is a corporation's of yeah, it's a fictional entity that's protected by government. It's kind of a government recognizes it as it as a a thing like a person that can own property and pay bills and do things that all a person could do, but it's not a person. Um, but rather, it's a collected collection of people's resources being managed by designated people. That you know, the board directors hire CEOs to hire other people, so they're all there to represent the people who own the shares of the stock. You know, it's very expensive to buy a video camera in the 1950s it's very expensive to broadcast it's very expensive to produce content to broadcast so in the 1950s you have the creation of the first tv networks abc nbc cbs uh, you know uh what is it cbc and um, whatever it is in the, the uk the bbc right so you have all these these broadcasting corporations some are government some are partially government such as pbs here in the u.s or the bbc in the uk um, and some are completely private such as uh, such as nbc and they produce this content and they're able to divide the cost of the content by sending the content across the country to all of their affiliates which then broadcast it and then they can charge ad revenue from it. They can charge advertisers to advertise the product and deliver this free transmission to people. So it's low cost, just the cost of buying the TV set and you get free entertainment that a peasant would be so grateful to have and even a king would think is interesting a couple hundred years ago. You know, before there was running water, there were running servants. So it's mainly the average person that gets the biggest benefit from corporate art. It's the same thing with cinema, you know, a, a camera which uh, a, cinema gra- a cinematography kind of camera costs a lot of money. Film costs a lot of money. Hiring all the actors costs a lot of money. Sound engineers, special effects engineers, directors. Before you know it, the cost is astronomical. So you have to create a corporation to pay for that. Likewise, recording technology is still expensive. And it continues to get more and more expensive as the quality goes up and up and up. So beginning in the 1950s, we have a rapid increase in the quality of the production which is created. And so this is the first thing that, or the first two things that encapsulate what I call the corporate period. The first one is art is made by corporations. And it's made by corporations because the technological costs involved, but because it's so diffuse, you can increase the production. That's the second thing. The production value is completely unrivaled in history. It's the best production value that has ever existed up until that point. And it continues to get better as these companies invest in newer, better technology. And as they are, as they grow, as more people get TVs, that means bigger bigger viewer base, more money. Money equals attention, right? It's a thing going that we've been talking about a lot. If you have a lots of people paying attention to your program, then you can sell the advertising slot at a higher and higher amount of money, just like with the Super Bowl. Um, so the production starts to go up and up and up and up and up and up. So that's the two big defining characteristics is that uh, most of the art is made through a corporate infrastructure, which decides what art is going to be made and produces it, secondly, at an extremely high production value. Um, so it begins in the 50s. In music, you have first superstars, um, with like Elvis Presley that are able to not only make lots of money playing music and be well known as musicians, but are able to cross over to like movie star, right? Elvis did movies. He's a big part of his fame was people saw him on TV and had that extra connection with his physical presence and could go buy his records. And it became totally corporate, like corporate hegemony by the time you get the Beatles. The Beatles are a corporate product because they of course, they didn't pay for their own recordings. They made tons of money. But ultimately, it was the corporations promoting them on their TV shows. It was the corporate infrastructure that made the Beatles great and made them who they were. If you look at the talent level of the Beatles, I mean, they, they're not talentless or anything like that. They're talented guys. But it's they're not like the Beethovens of the 60s. They were pop musicians that had a lot of great access to money to make really high production uh, quality stuff such as like Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band has unbelievably good production for the time that it was done. In fact, the production, I think, 
really outstrips, um, say, the quality of the theory that's writing the music. It's very stripped down theory. It's common practice theory. It's rhythm and blues, uh, but it's not nearly on the complexity of, of, say, hard bop, which was something going on at the same time, or even cool jazz, right? Modal jazz, things like that. Um, so anyway, you get uh, you get something like that. And then in the '70s, we have genrefication of music at the popular level, just beginning. You get that thing called heavy metal, where it's no longer about rock and roll and just the pop music, and then jazz, and then classical. It's like there's jazz, jazz fusion, there's cool jazz, there's acid jazz, there's funk, right? Then there's rock, there's R&B, there's hard rock, there's heavy metal with Black Sabbath and Rainbow and Deep Purple and guys like that. There's prog rock, progressive rock, there's disco, there's, you know, folk rock, all these, all the genrefication starts to explode about 1970 because as more people grow, there's more opportunity for more niches, but it's still predominantly controlled by the corporate infrastructure. It's where you have, uh, you know, the probably the capstone, I'd say the, the height of the corporate period is the 80s. This is when the corporate infrastructure was producing the highest quality art of the highest value to the culture of the highest amount of popularity and the highest amount of common interest that the world has ever seen. And I'd like to give you a couple examples. So I think it really kicks off with uh, Star Wars. Now it's not to say that there's other, not other great art before Star Wars. There's like Godfather, there's tons of great movies and there's tons of big hits that occur before Star Wars. But Star Wars begins it. Star Wars is this thing that's like, it's so huge. Everybody has this common experience called, we've all seen Star Wars. And then there's two other movies that are Star Wars movies. And you have these what are called high concept artists like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg start to really explode and make some amazing films. If you look at most of the films people have nostalgia for from the 80s, these are things which had a really deep connection with culture. They were widely popular. They were incredibly well made. So Star Wars is a good example. Indiana Jones, great example. You had things like uh, Alien, Aliens at the uh, 70s and 80s. You had things like Back to the Future. You had, of course, like the Terminator movies. If you go into the rated R area, you had movies like The Goonies, right? Uh, there was so many high concept films that came out in the 80s and really stuck. Now, we, of course, we forget most of the garbage from the 80s, but there was also that music. There was, in fact, what a lot of people call corporate rock. And the word corporate rock is something that I get in music history classes. If they're trying to talk about popular music, they're like, there's these corporate rock bands. Journey, Genesis, stuff like that. Corporate rock. It just means rock that's produced at a really high production value like Boston. You know, really high production value that lots of people like. The 80s is the heyday. It's the the absolute pinnacle of pop culture, what we call pop culture. And that is also when the corporate uh, period is at a zenith. And it's when the corporate period is producing the highest quality art that has the the biggest reach and the biggest cultural impact and the longest lasting cultural impact and relates to the culture the strongest. After this, you start to have a decay. And the decay happens for many reasons. The first big reason is increased genrefication. If you just look at metal music, by the time you get to the mid 90s in metal music, you have dozens of genres. You got goth metal, Black metal, death metal, thrash metal, prog metal, power metal, classic metal. I mean, go on and on. There was stoner metal. Uh, like, There's so many different kinds of alt metal, uh, new metal. Like, there's so many different kinds of heavy metal, and that's just one genre, like one style within this thing. There's gangster rap. There, there, how many different versions of rap were there? Right? There was a huge version, different versions of rap. Now, the genrefication is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's going to bring about the closure of the corporate period in music and the beginning of what I call the eclectic period. So now I would say we're in the eclectic or we're in the genre period. I don't know what, what else to call it. But these common cultural experiences are giving way towards a multitude of standardized experiences. Um, are a multitude of diverse experiences, which are less standardized, so the non-standardized experiences. So in the 90s, we had some of the biggest blockbusters come out. This is when you had the heyday of, of Disney, 
right? Disney cartoons, generally those early 90s cartoons were dynamite, every single one of them. Highest quality animation that had ever existed, high quality writing, highest quality music, highest quality everything. You had Jurassic Park come out in the mid 90s. But about, uh, you know, I've had a couple friends say 1997 is year zero. That's when the cultural collapse happens. After 1997, there's a dramatic decrease in the quality of the corporate art. Doesn't mean there's none, right? You still have Lord of the Rings. I like to look at Return of the King because I think that one came out in 2003. It was probably the last good best picture. Last good movie to win best picture. In the, and if I'm using good as in it is widely popular, relates to the culture, affects the culture, and is accepted and loved by the culture. It's the last one. So by 2003, the run of corporate art having deep relations to the culture at large is mostly run its course. So high art relating to the culture is done. And what you transition to after that is you transition to basically genre films that are just heavily invested in superhero films, things like that. Okay. So you get, that's, that's what you get in movies. Uh, and you get the same thing in music. Now there's a huge collapse that happens around the year 2000, a little bit after in the music industry. <laughs> The music industry, which is highly cor- still highly corporate, like you don't realize that, say, Morbid Angel had a ton of corporate support in the 90s. Uh, bands like Cannibal Corpse had a ton of corporate support in the 90s. They were, they were supported by corporations. They had a, a record label that paid for their recordings, paid for them to do it, paid for them to go on tour. They worked for a corporation. Metallica is corporate rock. They worked for a corporation called Electra Records, which was part of, I think is now part of Warner. I don't remember. At some point it was point of Warner might be part of Sony now. Um, so about 1997 appears to be a year zero where things really start to go off the rails. Hollywood, if we just look at the Hollywood, I call it Hollywood, but let's just call it the corporate infrastructure in music and, and film, starts to become very disconnected from the popular sentiment is not really producing art, which affects a lot of people. Whereas in the 80s, there might be young people and older people might like the music of the 80s. By the time we get into the 90s, almost nobody who's older likes anything from the 90s. So if you were a teenager in the 80s, you generally hate everything from the 90s. If you were a teenager in the 90s, you like things from the 90s and everything else as well. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> because there's other good stuff. But you start to get a separation there. You get those depressing, cynical 90s. And so the last gasp of the music industry tends to be these ultra-popular pop acts like Britney Spears, NSYNC. This is kind of the last gasp. Now, the collapse happens because of Napster. And it's not because Napster is an evil company that made an evil product and allowed people to steal the music. It's really because the consumer saw a better value opportunity. The consumers looked at Napster and said, wait, I don't have to pay $20 for a CD full of crappy music that has one song on it I like that I can't even listen to the others before I buy it. I can just download the album for free. Where do I sign up? So the collapse of the music industry, make no mistake, is due to piracy. Piracy is is the seed from which all the crystals grow and it is the primary thing which has destroyed the music industry from the corporate level. Now, once we get outside this idea of the corporate love the you know the corporate entities crashing means the music industry is over then you're going to see that a lot of music industry is better than it ever has been um actually i'd say the music industry is better than it has been since the 80s right now a lot of people don't see it that way because i make these things like there's no there's no money in music because we we start to have some amazing things happen in the in the 2000s so the music industry collapses because consumers no longer have to pay they no longer have to pay overpriced music the fact was is that cds were way overpriced they were much higher percentage of um of an income than what you know vinyls were so back in the 70s and 80s you bought vinyls you didn't have really anything else to buy but they also were like way less expensive compared to to cds even at the time like you know my my parents had a bunch of vinyls they bought for like 15 cents a piece it was like buying a comic book they were a couple bucks you know for most uh, 45s and things like that. And you bought singles and stuff like that. Um, and so the corporate period, first big collapses in the music period. It starts at the end of the 90s. Once people have, um, 
alternatives to paying too much for mass-produced music that everybody's into. And so the genrefication accelerates that. People would much rather, you know, buy, and the internet helps that as well, because now I can buy a mortal record starting in the 2000s from Norway that I'd never hear on the radio ever. So it's great for bands who were a little bit outside the mainstream because they could grow their fan base. They could get more people interested in their music through the internet. And it's bad for the bands that really relied on MTV and the corporate infrastructure because the consumers lose interest and they stop being willing to pay outrageous sums of money for music that they consider subpar compared to all the other things they get to listen to. Um, Now there's an art form that I've kind of passed over here, which is comics. And comics deserve special attention. The music industry is really begins this, but comics are are different in their own way. Comics, of course, need the corporate infrastructure because it costs a lot of money to print them and distribute them. Not that it costs so much money to draw them and write them. Uh, they're actually fairly cheap to write and draw, so they're very profitable up until the 1990s and the end of the 1990s when that industry starts to collapse as well after about 1997. Then it starts to collapse for its own reasons. And the reasons really boil down to the genrefication again. So we start having um, comics that are really focused. They're drawn by people who are comics fans. They really are focused on highly stylized art um, and these kind of long soap opera stories rather than having that mass appeal. We also lose a lot of the genres that existed in the, in the 70s and 80s. And so instead what we get are a bunch of repeats of titles. You end up with corporate milking. So Marvel and DC basically go into a mode where they are milking old IPs rather than creating anything new. And that, of course, is going to accelerate a collapse. You are no longer bringing in new customers. You're instead just trying to milk the long tail as much as possible. And that caused the collapse. Marvel was bankrupt until Disney bought them. So they were bankrupt at the, in the early 2000s and Disney bought them and resurrected them, bought them primarily to acquire their intellectual property rights, which they could then use to make movies. So the collapse of the comic industry is worth noting because, you know, rather than consumers getting some alternative like what they had, like they had with music, consumers lost interest before the internet like crushed anything, um, and they lost interest mostly because the corporate hegemony of DC and Marvel, you know, you end up with a two basically two player system and a bunch of indies that people really had a hard time accessing. You have that just milk the consumers and stop producing anything new or interesting. Um, it's kind of interesting to look at comics. It's just a little bit different side tale there because they were extremely popular in the 70s and 80s and 60s. People forget this. People think comics are like some kind of weird... I've, I've made content on this in the past. People think comics are some kind of weird nerd thing. It's like comics were super popular when I was a kid. You know, you could buy them at the drugstore, not at some comic book shop. You didn't have to do that. Um... So yeah, comics are their own thing. Now, movies are interesting, and I wanted to look at movies because movies have remained corporate. Like, we haven't had this big collapse of movies yet. Now, why haven't we had that? Well, the first reason is it's very difficult to make movies on on their on your own. In music, starting in the 2000s, we start to get a drastic decrease in the cost to produce music. You can produce it on your computer. By the time I was in graduate school, I could record an album on a computer for a couple hundred bucks or free. Just use the university's equipment, right? So that's a big change. Now, uh, in books, we also have a similar change in the 2000s, which is why we also have the corporate period in books. I kind of ignored books because, again, they're not. it's not the same as seeing everybody seeing the same person doing the exact same action from the same angle in a dramatic presentation. But we'd also have a corporate collapse in books that has been going on for about 10 or 15 years. And that's mainly due to Amazon, but just the explosion in the internet offering people the ability to, you know, further divide their genres and publish their books to the few people who are interested in them uh, and just do an end run around the, the corporate system. So once the corporate system's established, I think you can see this with comics, it becomes a ring of power and starts to be exploited. It becomes a necessary and appropriate for them to gatekeep and therefore also becomes 
the source of a lot of dysfunction in the corporate system. That you get a project approved not because it's good, but because of other factors like your sexual relationship you had with uh, a producer. That's what gets you the part rather than you actually being the best actress. Uh, that is a real thing in Hollywood. We know it is, and it's the result of the corporate system. But the corporate system is persistent in movies because it still costs a lot of money to produce a movie. There's so many people involved in movie production that it's still really difficult to organize a movie outside of anything besides a corporation. You can organize it with a small studio, which is a small corporation, or a big studio, which is a big corporation. But we haven't come up with a lot of ways to crowdfund or to just do this on a small scale. And really, it's not just the scale of money, but the scale of people. The more people, the more money in the story. Uh, so the Basically, the corporate response in movies has been to, rather than produce lots of different kinds of movies for lots of different tastes, uh, they're producing the movies with just the lowest kind of appeal, the lowest common denominator. Pure action flicks are what you really want to go for. So we have the MCU, which has done very, very well financially and has produced a number of, of good quality movies, but they don't quite have the same cultural resonance that Star Wars does, I would say. We don't have the same, it's the last gasp is the MCU and uh, big blockbuster movies like say Avatar or something like that. It's the last gasp of the corporate system because movies are the last place in the art from the 20th century where you still need a corporation to produce the product. Now there's one other industry I wanna mention before I jump into chat. This has been an hour long lecture and I hope you've enjoyed it. That's video games. Video games have risen to prominence and become an extremely important part of 21st century art, one that shouldn't be overlooked. If you go back to the 70s and 80s, video games were produced by very small teams, small numbers of people, which means they could be produced fairly cheaply. By the time you get to the 2000s, the quote AAA games are produced by really large studios requiring the corporate infrastructure to distribute it and things like that. But we are going to see, we're seeing again, and actually there was kind of a collapse of the gaming industry at the end of the say like 2009, um, but we're going to have more collapses of the gaming industry as people are able to produce really high quality games with smaller numbers of personnel um, that produce more original things than these AAA games. Right now, we're not there. We're not at the place where people can produce movies and AAA games on their own at the level that the studios can. But that's because Dude, 200, a $200 million game or a $200 million movie, it's really hard to do that with a small team. In fact, it's impossible. So until that becomes possible, you're not going to see a supplant, like a supplanting of that. And George Lucas actually predicted this. Him and Steven Spielberg said, all movies are going to condense down to these hyper expensive cinema experiences because that's all that's going to be profitable. So what is kind of cutting the bottom out of movies? Well, it's things like on-demand video watching, both YouTube, but also things like Netflix where people can watch whatever movie they wanted to in the past. People can buy on DVD or Blu-ray any movie from the past and watch it. So you're no longer competing with what's in the theater currently. You're no longer competing with what the two or three other major networks have on TV at, at your time slot. You're competing with all things ever produced ever. And so that's going to cause a major dysfunction. And it's going to come. So we're looking at the close of this. In music, it's already happened. The corporate period is over. It's really interesting because music usually doesn't lead the way as far as art periods go and art styles go. It usually follows, but in this case, it leads the way due to the due to its nature. Uh, and the book one has already collapsed. We've gone from the big six to the big five, and we're probably going to go down to like the big three or four in the next couple of years. Um, movie studios have also been condensing to where Disney buys 20th Century Fox, and now we're looking at just a handful of major studios that are left. So as they condense and kind of become a neutron star of proper IP property ownership. And of course, right now, the corporations are just trying to milk the intellectual property that they own for all that it's worth because the wheels are going to fall off the train. You know, you're running out of fuel. So you got to recover as much money as possible. Try to diversify what you're doing as much as possible. Put your money into theme parks so that when the bottom finally comes out of it, you're prepared for the next phase. But we'll see how that goes. Anyway, let's take a look at chat been an interesting hour of this. I didn't expect to talk for a whole hour, but that's the lecture. So um, share this. If you're watching the video after the fact, share this with other people on YouTube. Um, this is something I put a lot of thought into, and I, I hope you will have something interesting to say about it. 
Why do you think so many media corporations increasingly pander to the social justice obsessed crowd despite the lack of tangible financial rewards for this? It's because they don't, there's no uh, immediate penalties. So the I kind of mentioned this. There's a ring of power called the corporation. It's an it's an independent thing which you can gain control over by entering the corporation and having a position in it. So people go into the social they they go into the corporation precisely because it has already established an audience and they want to preach to that audience, not because they are receiving some kind of market information. Corporations are so big at within some of some kinds of our art that there really isn't any competition. So it doesn't matter, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it'll cause problems, but but people go into that to, to gain access to the audience, not to make money. And the fact that they don't make money doesn't matter. The point is to spread the message. Interesting about harmony considered emotionally manipulative. Do you have a source for that? Yeah, um, uh, it's gonna be it's gonna be, be kind of deep, but you know, if you if you've read the book, um, it's called Orthodoxy and Heterodoxy. It's by a guy named Stephen Demick talks about it briefly in there there's been some other historical sources you can you can read about this is early early church and you really don't get harmony in the catholic church until like the 11th century anyway it's called organum so whether that's a matter of you know dictating that there should of course harmony existed before that but um, whether that's dictated or it's just part of tradition we don't know in the catholic i'm not entirely sure in the catholic church but um in the early early church which would become kind of the you know the orthodox church harmony is uh was considered somewhat dangerous because it can manipulate your emotions without um you having to think about it and it's true like music affects you emotionally i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing though for religious music although i do go into protestant churches and there's the 7-eleven courses and i'm like okay i i don't i'm not affected by this personally i'm more affected by the deeper more robust music of the past star wars 9 trailer looks as though they've given up on pretending to make sense and just made a big dumb saturday morning cartoon what i saw with the with the trailer and i made a video on this but my kids were like jumping into the frame so i didn't put it out Uh, i'll make probably make one maybe after this it's just uh it's just a random series of images uh it doesn't set up the story doesn't tell you anything about what to expect from the movie at all and that's really what this trilogy is it's a random series of images they didn't design this they designed it from a corporate point of view which is to say not a person with a passionate story to tell about characters they loved but rather how do we milk how do we get the money out of their wallets how do we make people feel good about this like well we go with the original trilogy aesthetic so everything that you see in this like unlike the previous trailer which was literally scenes from previous movies this one is just the things from previous movies so you see like a star destroyer rising out of the ocean you see the death star which i thought was atomized by its explosion but apparently it's crashed on indoor and not only is it crashed on indoor but uh but kylo and ray get to go walk onto the set of return of the jedi i mean can you think of anything more pandering and stupid which is like dude we gotta have it's like remember how cool that set was in return of the jedi it's like yes we need to do it again but we need to have them walk back onto it it's like stupid you know it's it's nothing but stuff you've seen before at this point there's there's no story they're probably trying to edit the story together at the last minute just like they i'm pretty sure they did with um force awakens you can you can tell when you watch force awakens that the movie didn't like they started making the movie and had changed the story as they were going because it's about one thing it has one MacGuffin, and then they just discard it and go in a different direction halfway through hope your family are doing well they are always look forward to right stream my my baby's a little bit sick but otherwise it's okay yeah soviet realism art i didn't have time to talk about that so soviets you could think of the the soviet state infrastructure as kind of like a corporate infrastructure it's just unified with the state, right? So unlike in the U.S. where we have corporations separate from the state that have a relationship with the state, but it's not, they're not owned by the state. You know, they're protected by the state, they're created by the state, they're not owned by the state. So um, we get a weird dissonance in the West, which is where you have a huge corporate artist like Rage Against the Machine talking about how bad capitalism is, which has given them millions of dollars. And then you have someone like, uh, the guitar player from Rage Against the Machine, Tom Morello, posting on Twitter about almost crying when someone at the Star Wars bar gave him like a rebel sticker. 
and said like, we hear you're from the resistance. He's like, I almost cried. It's like, yes, corporation pats you on this head and says, good boy, good boy, good boy, speaking out against capitalism. It's like, we would like to own the state. You know, I don't know. I don't know why people fall for that kind of crap, but that's, that's what we get in the West. Um, this is funny. Con- consider, if you will, how rarely David says um or uh, or even has pauses between speaking. Fine orator. I appreciate that, but I constantly get comments about how I say uh and um too much. I think it's mostly from people who aren't, aren't native English speakers. That's nothing to say anything bad against my European and Asian friends or African friends if you're in Africa or wherever you happen to be. But I notice that if you don't speak English natively, if it's your second language, those little vocal things we do uh um those become more annoying to you (laughs) maybe we do it a lot in english i I really don't know but i noticed that people who speak it as a second language are a little bit more bothered by it maybe i just tune it out as noise so does this mean we are coming close to modern day art renaissance we're going to change into something i think we're going to change into the eclectic period the eclectic period is all about genrefication like really diverse art and then we'll probably have it filtered down into a couple things that are more popular as in about 20 years, right? So we have crucifixion. We have a cool genre called like Christian sci-fi. And then you have like other genres like gay puppy erotica, like cub, what do they call it? Cub porn, like awful. I think it's awful. But anyway, you have something for everybody. The human race is very diverse. So we're going to go from something to everybody to at least some balance there. So that's what I call it the eclectic period. Even the group of seven. I'm not sure what you're talking about. It's very Art Deco inspired. So Art Deco is its own style. You don't you don't have a lot of talk about it because it's not an, an academic style. What are your thoughts on the concepts of highbrow, lowbrow, millbrow? I talked about that. They are artificial. Mostly they're created by people who want to be recognized as more important and skillful and special than they actually are. And I don't really see these as distinctions. There's um, There is some distinctions between say the art of the folk and other things like art that's produced via patronage which would be like haydn versus the people at the local bar (laughs) that were never heard haydn's music even though we might be drinking with him on wednesday night um so there's i think it's mostly a construct and it's a construct created by the academics who aren't popular and no one likes to make themselves more important this is why you have things like literary fiction literary fiction is a stupid idea they're like literary fiction like that's like saying I'm trying to think of something it's like saying wet water it's fiction fiction is literature dumb dumb it's like well mine is special mine is high literature well I talk about real people experiencing racism it's like dude all the all the literature that you remember from the 19th century is would be considered genre literature today be like Edgar Allan Poe I'm like well that's gothic and it's like oh well Sir Walter Scott it's like that's historical fiction. He kind of created the genre. Uh, 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 James Fenimore Cooper, and it's like adventure fiction. Oh man, a romance, you know. What about uh, Charles Dickens? He's literature. I'm like, he was considered like comedy garbage when he <laughs> was alive. He's not considered highbrow. Or then you know, we read Pride and Prejudice, which is written for middle class um, white women to entertain them. You know. It would be nice if YouTube told me when you're streaming. I stream every week at the same time. Sorry, it didn't tell you. Uh, I apologize for that. Follow me on Twitter, and I always like tweet out the link ahead of time. Um, but I do do this at the same time every week so that if YouTube doesn't let you know, it's okay. YouTube has been killing all of my notifications anyway, um, which is why I've been having some trouble. What are your thoughts on Philip Glass? I like Philip Glass. So let me take a diversion and talk about minimalism. Minimalism is its own style, which is why people don't talk about it as part of the postmodern. Minimalism uses tonal music, which is also why academics have a very uneasy relationship with it. It uses orchestras and bands, which means that people want to create minimalist music in the academic setting. But generally speaking, it's not super well loved. It's liked by people who like minimalism, though, because it has a very interesting effect. It sounds really interesting. Movica, Steve Steve Reich, Philip Glass, John Adams, um, even really harsh stuff like Glenn Branca. Um, all of it has a different, a different appeal that's kind of non-academic. And I think that's why 
It's just not that doesn't seem to be that popular in academic circles. And it, it's kind of it's kind of like jazz. Like you can go to to a university now and study jazz, and that's only because it's sufficiently unpopular now that it's okay to study it at the university. And minimalism has never been so popular that they've cast it out of the academic thing. Oh, super chat. Thank you very much. Uh, monkey monkey bot ff subscribe to your channel after watching your video on religious themes in battle angel great vid and i've enjoyed your content ever since well thank you i'm very glad to have you and five dollars from aaron lane sent you an email uh oh uh, if it was about the book i read it but i didn't respond because i wasn't at my computer i haven't been at my computer uh, other than to draw the map last night and i really need a response so i apologize off topic but why is it frowned upon for main characters to be author self inserts <laughs> Well, if you do it right, then no one knows that they're self-inserts. It's frowned upon because once the author does that, he's engaging in a self-fulfilling, he's in, engaging in a self-fantasy, which means he's going to be making the story adhere to what he wants and not what the reader wants. And also, it usually results in much lower tension. The other thing is authors rarely have a good self-image, good enough self-image to actually insert themselves. They're either you know, like a Mary Sue self, you know, self insert. Of course, you're going to be great. It's it's a fantasy of you being great at everything, rather than a, the reality of of you. You're you're almost never inserting a real self. You're inserting your egotistical, imaginary self into it. Oh, you know, what if everybody loved me and I was a great warrior? Well, you're not, and some people are going to hate you. <laughs> So it's the result of that is that you start engaging in a fantasy where everyone loves you and you're good at everything rather than reality, which is that some people hate you and you're bad at many things, <laughs> right? We're all, we're good at a couple things. We're usually bad at most things. Hopefully that answers your questions. What are your thoughts? Okay, Philip Glass, where does something like John Barry fit into all this? I'm not sure. I'd have to think more on it. I find jazz easy to listen to in the background. Like whenever we talk about things that are really broad it's hard to get down into specifics for everything right not everything always fits just kind of like how sometimes there's deer with five legs it doesn't mean deer don't have four legs so i do appreciate the, the super chats let's see here i find jazz easy to listen to in the background like elevator music but hard to get into when actually focusing on it i can rarely follow the melodies like in a symphony well a lot of times they're improvised and a lot of times they're not that melodic it depends on the jazz some jazz is nigh unlistenable and some jazz is boring it just depends on who's doing it do you think that there's a significant difference between the early 20th century studio system which held a great degree of power in today's corporate film industry so there's a difference and there's a significant difference now the early 20th century studio system the, the director was of minimal importance they used to fire directors i think wizard of oz had several um today's corporate film industry is different Mainly in that the the budget is like orders of magnitude bigger and there's more people involved and there's more going on. And the distribution networks are broader and richer. Um, in the 20, early 20th century, I mean, that is kind of where like the beginning of corporate art really, I mean, film is like the beginning of corporate art. It did hold a great amount of power. It used to exercise that power over cinemas and all kinds of things it's very interesting to look at it um there is a significant difference mainly in that there's more power towards the market through you know less alternatives and things like that but there's also less power because there's more I don't know, there's more division between them and the cinemas i don't know there's probably a lot there to, to explore do you believe we will enter a renaissance for yes films and art yes well it's going to be different than what we want. Elvis wasn't the first musician to cross over into movies. Oh yeah, Frank Sinatra did it. That's true. Good point, Hardwick. Yeah. Bing Crosby. Um, he was the first one to do it on TV though. My Frank Sinatra was big in the 40s for sure. And the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. <laughs> Frank Sinatra was big for a long time. But Elvis, you saw him on like the Ed Sullivan show. You saw him on TV where kids could see him and his gyrating hips um so i think it's different once you get the tv the tv it's like that's really when the corporate period begins because everybody can watch the same thing in their home okay 
Found you via Niemeyer and instantly bought my cover, brought my cover art up a couple notches. Thanks. All right, you're welcome. I am always trying to improve my cover art. Um, let's see here. Boston was recorded in a basement, but it was incredibly good production quality. And it's still supported by 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 the corporate machine. Um, it's usually accepted that Jews started the blockbuster era, then Star Wars escalated it further. Well, I mean, um, there was a lot of Jewish people involved in the movie industry from the beginning. Uh, it's a family business, so it's continued to kind of focus on that ethnicity. It's very highly represented, right? Um, it's not just a joke if you were to look at it. It's, you know, there's a lot of Jews in Hollywood. It's very, very and it's a very, very big thing. The blockbuster, I think, is the result of the medium itself, not because of Jews. Blaming it on, oh, Jaws. I misread that. Jaws. Jaws did start the blockbuster era. Star Wars escalated further. Correct. Sorry, I was talking about Jews. I'm like, we're talking about Hollywood. Someone's going to talk about Jews. There we go. Jaws started the blockbuster era, then Star Wars escalated escalated it further. Yeah. So anyway, I, thought, I was trying to, I, I, was, uh, I was thinking too far ahead of you. Sorry. Um, I think they're remaking Return of the Jedi and Ray was right about Ben and he turns to the good side of the force. I think you're right. Let's see here. Have you seen The Artist 2011, which won Best Picture that year? I don't think I saw it. I might have. I'm not sure if I saw it. Probably didn't. Uh, the bifurcation of the art that I refer to. Yeah. Uh, I'm very fond of 1999 as a year in cinema. The Matrix, Sleepy Hollow, The Mummy, October Sky, Galaxy Quest, Bowfinger, Iron Giant, Office Space. Yeah, there's a lot of good movies. But I think, you know, we're, we're starting to be on the tail end of that. I think videotapes also have something to do with it because once you start making it more economical for people to watch the movie over and over again, they love the movie more. But you also are competing against movies of the past to a greater degree once you get the VHS. I should probably like integrate that into the lecture at some point. Marvel was already making its own movies when Disney bought it. Bob Iger approached uh, Ike Perlmutter about buying Marvel after he saw Iron Man uh, was such a hit. I don't think Marvel... Well, I, I, there's more to it than that. Marvel was bankrupt. Uh, Marvel Comics were. Or was so on the edge, like it was it was going under. Um, let's see here what I missed. Sorry, I got to hop back up here. There's a lot of stuff that gets hidden because they think it's like bad words. Um, have you watched the trailer for The Lighthouse? Nope, don't know what that is. Um, have you considered taking talking with someone like Mark Kerr regarding the corpus? Uh, oh, Mark Kern. Yeah, or Mark Kerr. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm probably not big enough to 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 get him on. Um, sadly, missed the, the last few weeks and didn't get to keep up with the book writing guide. It's okay. You do it on your own time. That's it. It's the same process. If it takes you ten weeks, who cares? I did it in six weeks. So like, if people really wanted to hammer it, and have that boot camp mentality, they could do it. Um, now the book I wrote for that, I'm not going to come out probably till December, and that's okay. Um, Missed the last few weeks. Uh, okay. The reason corporations pander to the to social justice because the people in the corporation are social justice. Social justice warriors are attracted to the corporation because of a chance to preach to people. It it has nothing, you know, that's the main that's the main reason they're attracted to it. People say watching hair dry is boring. Yeah, my hair's drying. Um, do you think there's a chance for new filmmakers to break into the industry this day and age? Or do you think it'd be easier to join a company and work your way up? I have no idea. I really don't. I don't know what the future will bring. Um, I know you're in the UK, so I don't I know anything about the UK. I know what it's like here in California. And for that, it's mostly you just, you got to know the right person and you got to sleep with the right person to even have a remote chance of a break. Sex abuse is rampant. Um, and I don't think, like I don't think anyone who's popular in Hollywood got there because they were good. I think they got there mostly like, Generally speaking, there's thousands of other actors who are probably just as good as whoever's popular. Same thing with writers. Is harmony heresy? I don't believe it. I don't believe harmony. Harmony is heresy um, at all. 
there's a great YouTube channel called SWC Revive where they talk about comics as digital and how comics gate wanted to go back to the 90s, aka the Great Depression of comics. <laughs> yeah, comics gate. I mean, I like 90s comics in a way, but um, I mean, comics gate is its own discussion. We don't need to get into for this live stream. It, it's a dumpster fire that's continuing to like now burn down into the pavement. Quite, quite awful if you want to look at anything with it on Twitter. Um, so I don't I don't do with it, do anything with it. The BBC's new War of the Worlds miniseries utterly butchers the story, largely for added PC subplots. The only thing that it gets right is the turn of the century setting. You know they're going to do it because it's an opportunity to get people. It's like people will watch it. It's like well we gotta we gotta have our message. Corporations are always sensitive to what women are saying because until recently, the structure of the family unit meant women did all the shopping for several people. It's true. Uh, there was a huge 1950s nostalgia trend in the 70s to 80s. There were such things as Greece, Happy Days, yeah. Um, so here's the thing about nostalgia of the past versus nostalgia today. So nostalgia of the past was for the time. Man, you remember the 50s? Yeah. Nostalgia today is, do you remember Star Wars? Do you remember this thing? Do you remember Battletech? Do you remember this thing we liked? Do you remember D&D? Do you remember magic? You know, it's remembrance of things, not times. Like there was no, there's nothing I could tell you about the 90s that defined the 90s at all. No style. I mean, there's stylistic things from the 90s, like, I don't know, Vans shoes or something. But there's no, I have no nostalgia for Vans shoes or for baggy pants or for, I don't know, whatever haircuts were popular in the 90s. And the only nostalgia is for the things. And so that's where the nostalgia is different, in my opinion. According to Gossip, they're still in production and trying, and trying on endings with test audiences. Star Wars Episode X. Yes, Episode X is going to be bad. I guarantee it. No amount of tinkering with focus audiences is going to fix it. Six potential endings, and they still haven't decided on which. Probably limited to who dies at the end, though. Yeah, if you, if you don't know where the ending is when you start, you're not going to create a good ending at the end. It's going to be Game of Thrones all over again. Yutaku says, I'll be honest, when it comes to Star Wars, I just don't care anymore. Something, if you ask me a few years ago, I'd tell you that I'd never say. Midnight's Edge has a few videos on what's going on in Lucasfilm, starting with George selling to Disney that explains why the Mouse Wars fails. Yep. Um, George Lucas, 20 years previously, the Republic is totally different. Ships, guns, armor, J.J. Abrams. 40 years after, everything is the same. Yep. Do you think that dissolving the protection of corporations such as granting the personhood would be a massive blow to the modern leftist culture war? Could be could online platforms survive? That is a great question. <laughs> From Aaron Lane. That is a great question. Um I think dissolving the corporate power structure will increase freedom and quality for everyone. And it will reduce the power of the left significantly. So I think that that's true. And the reason is any institution which can gain people's attention will be used by the left and will be targeted by the left. Remember, people are joining the corporations to put their message out, not to make art. This is the, one of the differences between the American left and the American right, at least, is that the right just wants to be left alone. They just want to grow crops and shoot guns and run their businesses in peace. And the left doesn't want that. They don't want people to do that in their piece. They want to get their message out. That's why teachers are, uh, schools are full of leftists. It's why the, you know, the education system is such a ring of power and so dangerous is because you're not only gaining people's attention by creating a quality product. I mean, like with, at least with the movie, you have to entertain them, but with schools, they're forced by law. If you don't send your kid to school, you will be jailed. You know, kids are forced to sit in those seats and listen to the propaganda for 13 years. No wonder people come out like illiterate and sociopathic. Um, people fall for pseudo anti-capitalism because they've lost meaning in other things. They derive meaning from the consumption in corporate art. I agree. It's funny how they'll talk out one side of their mouth like, capitalism bad. Give me more Star Wars. Give me more Star Wars. Capitalism bad. I can't wait for that new Star Wars movie. Capitalism bad. I'm such a rebel. I'm like the resistance. You know, it's it's nonsense. It's it's people have no perspective. It seems like um, I, this is the thing. People are like, oh, no one's excited for episode nine. It's like maybe no one you know, but you got to think the average person is is just happy to consume products and live their own lives. That's kind of the problem with the American right is they're pretty happy to just can just play their games and not think about it. 
man, I just want to play my, I just want to play World of Warcraft and be left alone. It's great. World of Warcraft's not leaving you alone though. You know, I know you want to be left alone, but you're not going to be left alone. That's the reality. We're not going to be left alone. Okay. So accept it. Deal with it. Um, you should check out Sir Roger uh, Scruton sometime. He is an English philosopher who details and decries the deleterious effects of postmodernism in art and culture. Um, okay. Demonetize. Yeah. I try to earn my IMAX presentation so I don't sound like a robot during my speech. Let's see here. Numbers accountant. <laughs> what are we talking about? Okay. I really enjoyed your videos about video games. Any chance you'll do more? Yes. I love the Super Nintendo games. I'll probably talk more about retro games. So here's the cool thing. If you buy a retro game, I don't have one here to show. If you buy a Super Nintendo game, if Capcom is like full evil, like they're an evil corporation that murders babies, they don't get, <coughs> they actually don't get any money if you buy a copy of Mega Man X. David Copperfield is a self-insert character. I didn't know that. More, although autobiographical would probably be a more accurate way to put it. James Bond arguably is a self-insert character as well. I don't, I don't know about that. After you said gay puppy porn, my wife said, but I don't want to go into this new art period. <laughs> That's funny. Can art be degenerate? Degeneracy is a constructed concept. So yes, it can be. If, it, if you define degeneracy a certain way, right? If you would just take the literal meaning of degeneracy, it means to reduce the genes, right? To make the gene pool worse. So art by itself can't be degenerate. It can encourage degeneracy, which would be, I mean, the way you would encourage degeneracy would be to, you know, I don't know, encourage murdering smart babies would, would be the most direct way, right? <laughs> or something like that. Or just to, to reduce the quality of the culture. Um, very few directors actually get to be the authors of their films nowadays. Christopher Nolan and David Fincher are a couple I can think of who get their vision of the big screen. Yeah, the era of the auteur is pretty much over at this point because the corporate machine doesn't want or need auteurs to create quality content. They can run through their formula and people will watch it. Did you see the declining tales on the YouTube trailers? No, I don't. I don't know what you mean. I'm not sure what declining tails means. Let's see here. Sorry, it jumped down. Interesting little story, but my great grandfather was a concert violinist in Poland who came over to the U.S. during World War II, and I forgot where I was going with this. Great. What do you think of races that are meant to be pure evil, like orcs from Lord of the Rings? Do you think it's silly to have an entire group of people embody a single attribute, or can it work? In Lord of the Rings, it doesn't. The orcs are not pure evil. You know, it says, you know, you, I, I pity them. <laughs> I pity even his servants. They're not pure evil. They were created by an evil force and they're perverted and more fallen than men, but they're not pure evil. What do you think of meta movies like La La Land and that Ben Affleck movie where the Hollywood saves people in Iran? I haven't watched them, so I don't have any thoughts on them. I don't watch movies. I don't watch these social justice movies anymore, guys. And I don't watch TV at all. And I don't really watch stuff on Netflix. I don't really consume visual media very much. I've had a huge decline on it over the years, and it's gotten worse this year as I've just realized that I don't, I shouldn't be giving money to people who hate me. Uh, the social justice crowd operates parasitically. Yes, they ride the corporation until it dies. Then they wear its corpse like it's a skin suit. <laughs> They move on to a new corporation and they point to their many accomplishments in different courts. Yeah, you know, I helped make this movie in this. I made these comic books in Marvel that helped kill it. Um, Star Wars used to have heart and soul when George Lucas was part of the franchise. I agree. It's just soulless corporate garbage now. That's what it is. They bought the the rights to make whatever they wanted. So they just repeat the aesthetics. They're like, they look at the fans as a, as a revenue source. You got to collect the rent. Um. I remember Christopher Nolan said he didn't get any love or help from the British film industry when he started out in the 90s, but perhaps things have changed since then. Yeah, I don't know enough about the, the industry in the, in, the, in the UK. I know here in the US, you either go independent and get your way in that way, or you do a lot of sexual favors. Those are the two avenues towards success 
in the film industry. You become so good independent and you're able, but even then you got to find people to fund your movies. So you have to be super charismatic at convincing independent millionaires to give you money to make a movie to hopefully make money on. You got to be really good at that or you have to sleep your way. You have to sleep your way into cameo roles probably or like, you know, the extras probably have to sleep with the studio guys at this point. The Lighthouse is a new psychological horror movie shot in a 1940s style on actual black and white film. It looks unique and interesting. The trailer reminds me a lot of Lovecraft. Okay. The sequel trilogy should have shown the New Republic as a grand, beautiful thing and made the stakes about preserving it. Instead, they had it as a nearly defeated underdog again. Of course, because they had to repeat. They had to repeat all the elements that were there. It delegitimized the victories of the OT, I agree. And then to copy the tone. Yes, exactly. But it does disrespect it, and it makes it hollow. Makes it feel hollow. If you if you don't view it as what it is, which is just corporate fan fiction. I was thinking about my question from another stream about artists avoiding talking about politics, and realized that Christopher Nolan, Sam Raimi, and others don't talk about politics. Everything's political. It depends on you know if you're just talking within the Overton window, you'll be fine. Problem is the Overton window will shift here and there, so you know you you're either being really careful. Or you're just being yourself. If you're really careful, eventually it's probably going to bite you in the ass anyway. Um, is there a left-wing message to the original Star Wars? I don't know if there is. I think the left-wing message, if you wanted to go left at all, is just like the Republic or you know the the rebels kind of represent diversity and. Um, the empire represents sameness, but that's not even like a left-right thing. That's at this point, that's really something else. It might have been slightly left when it came out, but I don't. I think it's just a general. I think it's just general messaging, pro-human messaging. Consider the anthologies that people make today. In the past, they might have spoken of Lucifer, Odysseus, the Pharaoh, and Moses, King Arthur, culture and religious symbols of centuries. Oh, the analogies. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, and maybe we've lost some connection with the classics. Could part of nostalgia be wanting to go back to a time before social justice ruined everything? Yes, I think so, but but I don't have that because here's the thing. Social justice ruined things long ago. There's nothing new under the sun. The left destroyed the educational system 50 years ago. And if you're in Gen Gen X or Millennial or Gen Y, whatever, anyone born after 1960, you inherited a fallen education system that was already completely destroyed and routed by leftist thought. Of course, that's the case. There were communists in active writing communist propaganda films in Hollywood in the 1950s. High Noon was intended to be one, but people took the message the opposite of the writer. (laughs) Oh, today people make analogies like he's like Voldemort. We're like the rebellion or resistance. The oldest reference they allow themselves to the overused he's Hitler. They don't even know anything about Hitler to call someone Hitler. It's like what? He's a he's a war hero? <laughs> Hitler was lots of things besides like a genocidal maniac. They imagine like Hitler's always like, I don't know, some supreme Satan rather than a human being. Uh, would you consider doing an analysis of or have you in the past that I missed of world building in the Dark Souls series? I haven't, but I haven't played enough world I haven't played enough Dark Souls to really do that. I find Dark Souls to not be a particularly interesting game for me to play. I don't have a lot of time to get good at a hard game at this point, and um, I only have the PC version and it runs like crap, which makes me not want to play it. Like maybe I'll buy it for Switch or something to play it. Um Demon Souls was cool, but I haven't played that in like 12 years or something. Um, the modern left is best encapsulated as a selfie of a person who wrote Smash Capitalism on the back of their phone. <laughs> yep. One movie franchise that did a comeback right is Jumanji. The 2000s, I didn't see it. It was respectful to the original, but went in a completely new direction. Okay. I didn't see it though. Probably because it was a sequel. It was a reboot. Culture is utterly dead. Myth is dead. It's not utterly dead. Myth is not dead. It's very alive. Meaning is dead. Nope. It's only if you only if you view what is 
put out as as the dying gasp of the corporate art period, are you going to view culture as dead? It's not. Barf up that black pill and get to work, dude. Barf up the black pill and get to work. If you don't like it, get to work. Love your content. Thank you. Would you appreciate videos on the revising phase, such as uh, common flaws, improvement opportunities, content-wise, not like grammar? Oh, would appreciate. Not would I appreciate. Sorry, I had, I had subjects in. I can do more of that, yeah. I've done some. Um, I can totally do some more. Uh, at some point, I probably will come out with a book, like a very, very streamlined book on how to write a book, you know. Here's the process. Talk about revision stuff. Um, how to approach revision. The thing is, like, the better you are at planning, the less revision you have to do. That's something that I really got to hammer home. Uh, the other thing is the idea of a long revision phase is mostly created by readers. I've talked to several other writers and artists about this. Readers and amateurs come up with this idea of, a, of an extended revision phase where everything's being revised, 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 revised over and over again, when in reality, that's just not the case. You know, your revision phase shouldn't be an extended phase. It should be hopefully quick and painless. Now, I've done a rather re extended revision phase for this book that's coming out uh, in a week or two here called City of Silver. In fact, I'll promo that a little bit. Um, uh, here you go. Let's look at it. So anyway, here's what the cover looks like, City of Silver. It's a high fantasy book, but there's some guns. It's related to my other series, but it takes place many years later. It takes place in the Sixth Dominion. So, very much later. And things are very different. It's a fallen and materialistic world. The religion is essentially materialistic. Uh, and everything flows from that. It's very interesting. You guys will like it. Um, but this went through an extended revision phase because it was one of the first books I wrote. And while I love the story and I love the characters and my wife in particular had a deep connection with this book, it was not ready for prime time. I had to fix some things, particularly the beginning because I was a more experienced writer by the time I finished it from my, how I was when I began it. So definitely this is this first act here is much tighter than what I originally wrote, much better. Um, and the follow-up books, there's less and less and less that has to be done because I got better and better at what I was doing. Um, okay, so check that out. comes out on November 1st. If you want to pre-order it, I will give you a pre-order link right now. Uh, Pre-orders for the ebook are appreciated. If you want to buy it uh, on physical, the physical will come out uh, a couple days before the Kindle so that you can order it and get it in your hands a little bit later, okay? Um, so that's what's gonna be up with that. Let's see here. Ben Affleck movie where Hollywood saves the hostages. I thought that was, I missed a bunch of stuff here. Let's go up here. Bup, bup. All right, let me back here. All I have to say about Star Wars is space horses. Do you think that things are now with everything being exposed in the film industry that Hollywood are trying to redeem themselves? They're trying to seem like they care about it, but they're not going to redeem themselves because the people that are in charge of it. Argo's, Argo's the, the Hollywood propaganda one, yeah. Yes, that's correct. I remember, uh, I remember turning that movie off because I thought it was boring. <laughs> Don't mind me. I don't think they're trying. I think they're trying to convince people that they've redeemed themselves and that they're good people, because it's crushing to them the idea that they're evil. But they're evil. Has consuming less visual media had noticeable impacts on your life? Stronger imagination, less time wasted. Well, yes, it has. Less time wasted for sure. Stronger imagination. I've always had a very strong imagination, but uh, maybe it's improved it. It's definitely made me more bored more often, which just makes me read more or just do more work in my head. Um, but it really hasn't, it's mostly that you cut things out of your life you don't have time for. So really it's just, I replaced that with things I'd rather do. Um, watching movies is really far down the list. Watching movies is like, you know, number one is family. I spend like 15 hours a day with my family. <laughs> 
uh, number two's writing and then number three's like if i'm going to do entertainment i'd rather play a game or read a book there's just things that it's just less preferable so it's not like i cut it out and got a health benefit from it like cutting out social media though you can get health benefits from that it's really just you know i filled it up with things i like better <laughs> the reason the republic is an underdog i think is less to do with unoriginality more to do with s SJ liberal inclination towards always seeing themselves as good and rebels. It's true. Even when they're like owning all the corporations and they're in charge of the government, they're like, we're resisting Donald Trump. It's like, it's nothing to resist, guys. You're not resisting anything anyway. Let's resist him. Let me take a picture real quick with my iPhone. Regarding avoiding financially supporting certain movie corporations, one can still legally see movies without supporting the makers by buying used copies or borrowing a library copy. Excellent point, Hardwick. Yes, you can buy used copies and then they don't get it. They don't get the money. That's very, very good. Hitler is lit literally is the Satan of the post-theological worldview. There you go. That's a great point. John Ford and John Wayne hated High Noon and saw it as un-American garbage. They intentionally made Rio Bravo to be the exact opposite. Yeah, audiences didn't really see the un-American un part of it. They're just like, yeah, it's about a guy like standing up. What are your thoughts on the Baldur's Gate games? I like them a lot. Um, <sighs> Read Harlan Ellison. He refused to dumb things down. Yep, he did. He was also a, a jerk and wasn't nearly as original as he thought he was. He was a gigantic, horrible person. Completely impossible to work with. <laughs> Could you have a comic creator come on to talk about comics? I have, I've had Jesse on. I'd love to have him back on um, from uh, Green Devil Properties. In fact, he's he's got a crowdfund that's going to launch on November 1st. I think the same day as my, or maybe Halloween, same day as my, my book. So I'll be helping him promote that. He's great, super skilled, very good at being able to figure out uh, important things with art. Obviously knows the history and the industry well. Uh, Tolkien created a myth in the 20th century, smack dab in the middle of modern art movement that that declared myth dead. Yeah, the whole idea of modern art is that you can make your own myth and that myth doesn't mean... I mean, it starts from an atheist perspective, which is that there's no deeper meaning. Therefore, you can create your own aesthetics that mean whatever you want. Um, clearly, I missed something here. Hitler is simply the new Satan, and every bad World War II man is part of his black parliament of devils. Trotted out to describe more specific sins like zealot reading from um, Dictionnaire Infernal. <laughs> yeah. Were movies always propaganda, but more or less subtle? No. There's always propaganda, but not all movies were propaganda. Not all movies are propaganda today either. You know, paint with too broad a brush. Um, you know, Chuck Jones and Warner Brothers totally made propaganda movies for army recruitment. They did it. Will physical copies of Silver City be available? Yes, they will. They will come out a couple days ahead of the ebook so that you can get them in your hands. You will get the ebook for free if you buy physical, always. Do you find your stories come together in your mind's eye in words, the prose itself, or mental images? Uh, mental images and then transmuting into prose is what I tend to do. I don't, they'll come in as the prose itself. Uh, I, I don't find it that challenging though, but again, I have more. I have more experience as a writer. Uh, Darth Kilhoon, Hitler, 11 million dead. Mao, 60 to 100 million dead. Who's worse? To me, it's Mao. Mao's also had a more long-lasting impact on philosophy. Um, the left will openly declare their love of Mao's philosophy with, without really thinking that he's objectively worse than Hitler. You know. Do you like any rock and roll or rockabilly music? Yeah. You know, I used to really like Reverend Horton Heat. Stuff like that. What are your thoughts on Elvis Presley? I like Elvis's music. It's a great map for your book. Thank you. Sorry for the misplaced question. How light am I allowed to go with world building before it feels wrong? I have a pet project that would cost me a lot of money to really world build. How would it cost you money? I'm, I'm curious how it would actually cost you money. I guess I don't understand the question. World building is what you do. It cost me nothing to make this map, guys. I made it. I drew it myself. So I've spent zero dollars world building. I don't know how it could cost money. I was thinking something about info dumps. 
It's better to info dump sometimes than to do things di- indirectly and have people be confused. How did you meet your wife? We were music students at the university level. So we were music students together and then we had we didn't we didn't start dating until like I was like 29. She was 30. She's a little bit older than me. Um, so we met when I, it wasn't until 10 years after we met that we started dating. So we had separate lives, separate relationships, all that kind of garbage. And uh, obviously none of those things worked out and then started dating and got married. Um, so I don't have a ton of advice, dating advice. I was never like the best dater. And to be honest, personal relationships were always extremely low on my priority list in my 20s. Um, and that's not because like I'm a bad guy or something. Uh, like I'm undateable. It's just it wasn't a big priority. Like I had girlfriends and, and things. I'm not the best guy to ask for dating advice because at this point I've been married longer than like well, you know, then these dating apps have existed. But my my general thing would probably be you need to go to the places that have the people that have the values that you want. My wife and I have similar values and we met by accident because we were both interested in music, but we both probably shouldn't have been music students because it's not the best choice. She's a, she's a speech therapist now, speech pathologist. So we do different, we both do different stuff, you know. We have music degrees, and I write books, and she uh, she does um, music th- uh, does uh, speech therapy. We need to accuse person X of propaganda and lying. Shall we call him uh, Saint Just or Nessos? Maybe Prospero? No, he's the Gobbles Devil. <laughs> Tolkien created a myth in the twentieth century. Yes, I read that. see here one com by the way if you want me to respond make sure you tag me one comic creator that might be willing to come on your stream is micah curtis yeah um i was on a stream with him a, a while back and doug ernst too yeah um so i know both those guys we'll, we'll work on it in the future someone is an evil perverse doctor is he faust is he frankenstein dr jekyll no he's mangel um did you ever play Neverwinter Nights? Yes, I did, and I loved it. And I also played Neverwinter Nights settings in D&D, which were great. Or the Neverwinter setting, I think. Was it just called Neverwinter? Yeah. Um, glad I could catch you live. Thank you. Quite a few atheists take an approach to myth quite similar to Joseph Campbell. They are deep truths to the stories we tell each other and never needed God to understand Ben-Hur. The problem is, is that there is no truth without God, when you get deep enough, if they're if they're pointing to some deeper truth about us, then you are always referencing something beyond the physical. You're 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 outside the materialist worldview. So if you have a completely materialist belief, then you're just a moist robot. And so if you're a moist robot, there really can't be any deeper meaning. That it's completely constructed. This is this is where the modern heresy comes in. Mike Browning, ten dollars. Thank you. Do you think the deep rootedness of their culture is how Japan has avoided having their art descend uncontrollably into gravels over race, ethnicity, acceptance, and other forms of narcissistic noise? It's not just their culture. It's that they've been racially the same, right? So culture and ethnicity are usually bound up and they've had the same ethnicity. So it's really easy to have the same culture when your ethnicity hasn't hasn't changed. Whereas in the West, we've had shifting ethnicities. So of course we have shifting cultures. Different ethnicities move in, they change the culture. <laughs> Hold on. It's stop motion, so I can't build a lot of scenery that easily. Oh. Well, you're operating in a in an art form that I don't really can't really give you any advice on. Do you plan on going to on Please Rewind show or having him on yours in the future? I'd love to do more content with him. He's great. Any specific bad World War II man is used? To, but the thing is, like, he focuses a lot on movies, and I, I don't as much anymore. I'm probably only going to talk about classic movies. I'll probably maybe talk about a classic movie pretty often. You know, Conan the Barbarian or something. 
Conan the Barbarian. <laughs> Something cool. Uh, let's see here. Mao was worse than Stalin and Hitler. Stalin was worse than Hitler. We were allied with the worst of the two. In my opinion, he did much worse. What trilogy do you think is worse? The Hobbit trilogy? It's, it's not to say anything that Hitler wasn't bad. What trilogy do you think is worse? The Hobbit trilogy or the Star Wars sequel trilogy? To me, the sequel, sequel trilogy is worse than the Hobbit trilogy. Um, but the Hobbit trilogy, I really don't like. It kind of craps all over the source material. When Disney moves all their new content to Disney Plus, will movie theaters suffer financially? No. Because movie theaters will have the new content. So the way it's worked for years now, movie theaters have new content in big format. Whereas streaming services have old content, little format. But uh, people's home theaters are getting better and better as we go. Okay. All right. So we're starting to run out of time. We've got about 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, Bob says he has his Conan the Barbarian DVD within reach. I was going to do a Conan video and I didn't do it. On There's just this great scene. So, you know, um, Conan and, and his friend are, are riding around looking for the snake cult. And the, you've got this great voiceover. I'm trying to remember the name of the guy who does the voiceover. You know. Children of... What was it? Children of Doom. Doom's children. They told my lord to lay down his sword and return to the earth. Earth. Ha! Time enough for the earth in the grave. I'm like, this is like anti-hippie. I love it. They're clearly hippies. They're like wearing flowers and stuff. It's like, there's nothing new under the sun. You know, time enough for the earth in the grave. Like, what a what a, what a a cool thing. Like, the, just the movie is full of these great quotes. There's nothing you can trust in life, Conan. Not men, not women, not beasts. And he holds up the sword. But this, this you can trust. What is best in life? <laughs> to crush your enemies see them driven before you and to hear to hear the uh, lamentations of the women Darth Kilhoon says I missed the super chat I didn't think I did Hitler equals 11 million dead Mao didn't I read that did I miss another one I'll go quickly through all of it I, I talk about Hitler and Mao I appreciate the super chat though I really do voiceovers Mako Probably avoid Randy and pontificating in chapter long speeches. Okay, this is a great one. How do you avoid being preachy? How do you avoid coming off being preachy in writing? How do we write characters with different political ideas and philosophies without coming off preachy in propaganda? You just got to keep it short to the point and keep it relevant to the plot. So, this is one of the problems with, with Rand's books. Okay, she has these, John Galt goes on these long freaking soliloquies explaining something that she thinks is philosophically important but which bears really nothing to the plot so if you, as long as you keep it focused on the plot the speeches won't get too long and you're not going to seem that preachy and the other thing is you have the you have the character earnestly believe in what he in what he says but you also have to have doubt and conflict and other characters not believe it too you know it's much better if they have conflict over it rather than you know just long preachy things this is also a problem in starship troopers starship troopers had these long sections of just preaching about about the you know the infantile hippies who you know want are entitled like some entitlement generation he believed in back then um rather than having a story there's not much story in starship troopers it's mostly talking about ideas which that's part of its strength in a way but it also just makes it not a very fun book to read there's just not a lot of story there between the time when the oceans drank Atlantis and the rise of the sons of Arias there was an age undreamed of and unto this Conan destined to bear the jeweled crown of Aquilonia upon a troubled brow <laughs> tell you a tale of the days of high adventure grant me revenge and if you do not listen to hell with you 
Hitler might have been onto something. Uh, he might have been on something. He might have been crazy from syphilis, too. Everybody's trying to figure out what was wrong with him towards the end. Objectivism can be plot-based as well, right? I think it can be. Totally. Would you consider having Thomas Roylup from SWC revived on your channel? I don't know anything about him. Uh, I'll, maybe I'll check it out, but I don't know anything about him. And, and I may not... My feet, my channel's not that big, guys. I can't ask a ton of people on. Um, the soundtrack of Conan the Bar soundtrack of Conan the Barbarian is like one of my top five scores, easily. I'm always wondering about that poster behind you. Is that from an anime version of Marrying Jesus? It's just something that made its rounds on Twitter, and I found it on DeviantArt from the artist who's a Catholic artist, and I bought it and put it up on the wall for people to talk about. Wasn't the villain from Conan James Earl Jones? Yes, Thosadun. George Lucas wasn't overly preachy when it came to politics in Star Wars. He really wasn't. And he just kind of like let the conflict do the talking. The Matrix also suffers from pontificating through exposition. There are some real cringe moments in those flicks. I don't really think so. I don't think it I don't think it suffers. I think it's it's part of it. Any advice for writing the motivations and agendas of eldritch entities who inherently or inherently alien? Hitler had Parkinson's. I I didn't know that. Um, so what's the motivation you have to think of what they want like do they harvest souls or something or do they have to create madness in people to be reborn I don't know <laughs> you, you have to think of something that's that's going to be weird I mean for my eldritch entities they, they kind of they feed on the human mind they consume it so the human mind or the human soul sanity is like a, a food to them. We don't want to understand stand it, but coherent thought they eat. You know. Crom dwells on his mountain. What do you used to call on him? <laughs> little, little he cares if men live or die. Better to be silent than to call his attention to you. He will send you to your dooms, not fortune. Crom is grim and loveless, but at birth he breathes power to strive and slay into a man's soul. How much flat could an author get for making an anti-communist pro-imperial monarchy? Probably a bunch, but do it. <laughs> the flack is, is going to be an anti-fragile. If you're getting flack, you're over the target. The narrator who was in Conan was also the voice of Aku in Samurai Jack. I did not know that. You should get PewDiePie on to talk about memes, lol. Yeah, I'd love to have PewDiePie on my channel. These be so interesting to talk about. There are many biographical anecdotes uh, that show that the casting couch situations are often bluffs uh, that one can refuse and still get ahead. Interesting. Okay. All right. We got about three minutes left. About three minutes left. So. Let me say thank you all for showing up. Thank you for the super chats. I really do appreciate them. Thank you for listening to my lecture and giving some feedback here. Um, I'll continue. The stream is going to continue probably through the end of the year, and then we'll think of something new. So what I would love to hear from people, whether if you want to email me, stu at dvspress.com or stu at dvspress.com, or you just send me a message on Twitter or something, what you think would be a good streaming format to get guests on. I was thinking about just having a stream that focuses on indie art. They just really... Just get people on that are indie artists and talk about their art and just talk about culture and talk about other things that, that we love, you know. I can't blow my nose. I don't have anything to blow it into. So stop um, stop bitching, please. There are many biographical... Okay, miss this. If you make the communists fight the imperials into racists, then you'll probably be fine. <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Also, I actually can't blow my nose because it's inflammation, dude. No, it's not. But anyway, every everybody's everybody's got something, some kind of thing to bitch about. You should bitch less in the future, please. It's annoying and serves no purpose. Okay, this is a good one. Um, John Milius was allegedly blacklisted in Hollywood for making anti-communist Red Dawn. That I've heard that as well. 
um, that people did not like it, but still somehow the movie got made and promoted, but somebody wasn't, wasn't okay with it. Is it okay if a character at first has no motivation, but part of his motivation is him finding amidst in all that chaos of the plot? Yeah. Yeah, that's kind of the call to, that's kind of like the call to adventure. You know, you're, you're, you're given meaning. It's like, hey, um, come on this adventure. And then you, you go on that adventure and you find the meaning. That's kind of what Luke does. It's totally okay. It's okay to, to start with a, a nihilistic worldview and find meaning on the way. That's uh, Han Solo, right? It's a very, very good. It's a very, very good thing. On the issue of preachy writing, I see writing becomes preachy when the point of the story is to preach. Yeah, if your story serves the point, which is kind of Ayn Rand, you know, the story serves some kind of point she wants to make rather than the other way around. Like the point is really just kind of in there with the story. And it's okay to make a story with a point. Like 1984 obviously has a point, but you got to follow the good writing. You know, you got to follow the story. Um, let's see here. Yeah, the Stalin era USSR was extremely racist and they weren't Natsok. Yeah, they weren't. Um, I mean, you can make points that like the Chinese ones are racist as well, that the China's racist. Someone's complaining that they don't like, they think I need to blow my nose. Uh, Thomas Roylup was on John Delarose stream if you want to know who he is. Yeah. John gets a lot of good people on. From an objective... <laughs> from an objective quality standpoint how good of a musician is Inya I don't know because I've only heard her but if I were to to judge her by her music it would be moderate quality like the same quality that I hear from other popular artists which is to say middle of the road and, and stars talent <laughs> Red Dawn is a fantastic movie watched it the other day I haven't seen it in years uh I'm also confused how they let it become a pop culture icon. Um, icon. Yeah, I don't know how that e how that works either. Tell the tell the Uyghurs who's the real racist. Yeah, there's a lot of suppression of uh, non Han cultures in China. I mean, it would feel like ethno state's bad. I'm like, do you, you know the Chinese basically run an ethno state? Most states are ethno states by default because your country, the borders of your country, are defined by how spread the main ethnicity is. So of course, Japan is an ethno state. Only Japanese people live there. It's by default an ethno state. You know? Are you familiar with Russell Kirk? I'm not. How do you make up words and names without them sounding silly? I try hard. I, I sometimes revise them a bunch of times. But I don't know. Sometimes I let my son make, make up names. And he'll he'll like come up with funny names and just use them. Okay. All right, guys, it's eight o'clock. It's time for me to go. I gotta eat some dinner. I haven't eaten since like noon. So I'm pretty hungry now. Um, I do really appreciate all of the super chats. Uh, I'm new to writing, would like to start my first project. What preparation should I do before just diving into the writing? I'm not sure um, what the writing process is like. There's really a good manga called Origin where the main character is a robot figuring out how to live properly in an action adventure. Cool. All right. This is probably it. Um, thank you guys so much for hanging out with me, and I really, really do appreciate the super chats. City of Silver will be out November 1st. Um, here's the link again if you want to check it out. Um, and the physical will be out a little bit ahead of time, and I'll make sure you're on my mailing list, dvspress.com slash list. And... I'll send out the emails ahead of time to to uh, let you know when the physical is ready to, to buy, okay? So thanks so much, and I'll see you guys next time.